Nicholas, Newcastle on Tyne, with its strange medieval steeple hanging in midair and counterpointed by a truly terrifying statue of Queen Victoria done by Alfred Gilbert, who was the same man who did the Eros statue in Piccadilly Circus. Tired, grumpy old lady, not what you'd expect for a respectful piece of sculpture. The cathedral was a medieval church, it wasn't built as a cathedral, a real city church, just put down here right in the middle. And it's a real city, it's in too. I've used a lot of superlatives about Newcastle the past ten years or so. Each time I think, oh, it can't be that good, I've overstated the case again. And yet each time, when I see it for the first time, coming over the time, the whole excitement of the place gets me just as though it was the very first time I'd ever seen it. The bridges, the tangle of roads and railways, the skyline beyond, and the great chasm, precipitous slopes down to the river below. Because the great thing about Newcastle is that all the parts are acting together, all the layers of history are mixed up. When Granger and Dobson built what was almost a new city in the 1820s and 1830s here, they didn't just clear a bit and build a new town, pristine and complete. They threaded their work through the old streets. So you suddenly come out of a medieval alley into a broad Regency street. When the railways came, they did what should have been a barbarous thing. They ran a railway right through the castle, between the castle gatehouse and the main keep. If you thought about it in the abstract, you think, what a terrible thing to do. But it works because now you've got the two levels of Newcastle there at once, medieval Newcastle and railway Newcastle. And the same thing goes right through. There's a medieval city clustering around the water. Then came Granger and Dobson. And now we hope the 20th century is going to add its bit. And the part of Newcastle that most needs something doing to it quickly is the area that slopes steeply down to the river. The part that's got the chairs running through it, these great sequences of narrow staircases running between walls, formerly running between walls that belonged to houses. It was already in a bad way, oh, well before the war. About 1960, when they were first really talking about revitalizing Newcastle, there were still just one or two people clinging on living, one or two shops. There was a little hairdresser's shop on one chair. But in spite of all the good intentions, absolutely nothing new has been built here in the last 10 years. There are plans, there are plenty of them, but nothing has actually gone up. And meanwhile, the very few old buildings are getting in a worse and worse condition. Some are really desperate now. And I'm afraid that if it goes on much longer, the structures will be so bad they're going to have to clear the whole lot and start again. If the hillside had been filled in with modern houses, not completely, but patched in with the old ones, you could have had a marvellous place. As it is, a couple of houses under the high-level bridge on the very last legs. One of those, too, is probably unique in England, I should think. It's a four-storey, half-timbered building, still with its loading crane, still really used in, in its medieval purpose. The great force of this part of Newcastle is just like the rest. that You could see all the layers going on simultaneously. Oh, 
I'll give any money and you for your trouble rewarded shall be to ferry me over the town to Mahoney or school or across that rough river to me. Another key, another country. This is England's Garda, which is English Street in Aarhus in Denmark. You may not have heard of it, but I think that's a pity because I'd like to show it's a very nice town. It's also very like Newcastle in the way that both seem to be looking eastwards out to sea. They've both got the same feel. Aarhus is Denmark's second largest city. It's about oh, almost 200,000 people now. It's the capital of Jutland, which is the mainland part of Denmark. And the sea it looks out onto is the Baltic. Most of its trade is with Baltic ports. <laughs> that ship you may be able to hear unloading just behind me now, in fact, comes from Rostock in East Germany. It feels very like Newcastle would have been if there hadn't been an industrial revolution in the 1800s and all the coal field and the extra people that brought. Aarhus didn't really start as a port till about 1850 and its industrial revolution is really happening now, it's happened since the war. But the centre is still a very easy, comfortable place to be in. I first came in 1962 just for a very brief visit and within about half an hour I felt immediately at home in the place. You can sort of wear it like you wear a suit of old clothes. But it's all happening immediately around the harbour, just at the back is a cathedral, but just like Newcastle's cathedral is right in the street, there's no churchyard around it. It may look a bit drab and red brick outside, but the inside, which is whitewashed, is very large and spacious and dignified. And the little square beside the cathedral, the theatre, opposite the cathedral, the Royal Hotel, which is a sort of old-fashioned hotel you might find in an English country town. Along from there, the main shopping street winds up to the station, not too wide, cosy, comfortable easy to be in. It's a town with an immense sense of civic pride, also like Newcastle. They're extremely proud of the town hall which they carried on building right through the war and which unlike most town halls built at that time wasn't attempting a period style. It was one of the first of the truly modern town halls to be built anywhere in Europe really. It's very much the kind of place that an English industrial city would I think like to be. It, it hasn't any problems particularly, not employment problems very few slums and the, as far as I can see the only colour problem Denmark has is with Eskimos. But as I want to say later in the programme, I'm not quite sure that's, that's enough whether the social virtues are enough in a place. But if it has very few old buildings of its own except a cathedral, what it does have is a, a lot of old buildings from everywhere else, from all over Denmark in fact. Perhaps the only thing in Aarhus that is generally known well outside Denmark. It's a museum of transplanted and reconstructed houses it's called Gamlibu.
was started in 1909 with a single house. Now there's just about a complete village, over 50 houses, and all it really needs, and they're looking around for one, is a church. It is beautifully done. It's a marvellous illusion, and yet it worries the hell out of me in several ways. Because if you come at 10 in the morning when people aren't here, then the illusion holds. Bang, you're back in the 17th century. But it's been made for people to come here. And once you have people, as you have now, crawling all over it, and that's, that's its function, then the thing is destroyed. There is something basically wrong with the idea in the first place of, of setting up an open-air museum like this without setting up life inside the museum to counteract the visitors from outside. For although there is a, a cafe here that uh, sells beer and a bakery that sells bread during the summer season, there's no one actually living here all the time. It's easy to say live in it, I can't quite think who. I don't know, perhaps some people would like to play a complete pastiche life, actually act out the whole thing. That's an honourable way of doing it. It, it's, I find terribly sad to concentrate the past as though it was all something just to look at and pour over a bit of Disneyland rather than having it living. As I say, it has been done beautifully. Why on earth can't we do it in modern buildings? And in fact, the best of Danish modern buildings almost approach that. Aarhus University for me is one of the really great things in modern architecture. It was started before the war. It's taken something like 30 years to build. And the plan is of all the separate parts of the university around a park with lakes in. And the result's marvellous because you get a, a real blending of the trees on the slopes and the ivy on the brick buildings behind. And it's all done without any flashy tricks. It's simply proportion and this mixture of man and nature and exceptional craftsmanship. There's no stained concrete around this one. Well, if Newcastle has its Granger and Dobson, with Granger as the speculator and Dobson as the architect, I think the equivalent in Aarhus for Granger would be the state and the municipality. And for Dobson, an architect who works here called C.F. Muller, who, again, for me, is one of the real greats in modern architecture, more than many famous names. Because he's built nearly all the buildings here. He's built an art gallery. He assisted in the town hall with Arne Jakobsen, which is another Newcastle link, because it's Jakobsen who is to do the rebuilding of Eldon Square. And throughout, in all these buildings, he's kept the same honest, unfussy, totally self-respecting style. He's never gone out and looked at the architectural magazines and thought, oh, that's a good gimmick, I'll use that, as so many people have. And the result in all these buildings and also in the buildings that the Aarhus Municipality puts up, seems to me to be just about perfect for Denmark. It's unshowy, it's simple, it is beautifully built, even tempered, but at the same time it's capable of really dramatic effects. I'm sitting in the Royal Arcade in Newcastle, it's another slice of Granger and Dobson. It was put up with a very formal entrance at the end of Moseley Street and Pilgrim Street. And behind that, they had a deep passage, two stories, top lit, like so many of the arcades in London. It never really worked because it was intended to connect up with more of the town at the eastern end, and that never caught on. So it was always a kind of dead end. It was always in trouble, first of all in commercial trouble, and then in trouble because it was in the way. And now it's in real trouble, because look at it. See, what happened was that Newcastle said, fine, the Royal Arcade's got to go. We've got to have a roundabout in Pilgrim Street, but we'll take it down carefully, we'll store the stones, number them, and then put it up again somewhere else. And that's fine. That's what Newcastle's about, this reuse and everything, you know, going on over and over again. But not like this. This is just like a bomb site. It's a bit of slum clearance. The stones are anyhow. Anyone can get at them. I think the numbers are slowly wearing off because it look as, looks as though with the rain you have in Newcastle that the actual paint is wearing away. 
So we've been conned, Newcastle's been conned, I've been conned myself. Now where the arcade used to be in Pilgrim Street, there's a new office block on a roundabout. It's meant to be the set piece you see as you drive across the Tyne into Newcastle. And in the middle of it, almost invisible, is a replica of the inside of the Royal Arcade with pilasters and plaster work. Technically, this is a beautiful job, it's as good as any of the restorations on the Nash terraces in London. But I don't think it's going to work as part of Newcastle. Because, as I say, this building's on a roundabout, and pedestrians will have to get there through the usual man-hating kind of underpass. Who's going to bother? In a way, this is as unreal as the old town in Aarhus. For that's all genuine buildings re-erected on a completely different site. And this is an immaculate replica put up on the same site. But neither really contribute anything to the towns they're in. And the building above is all right, it's decent, but it's no more than that. When you get there, the long journey up and across the Tyne, you think, oh. It's been left to Gateshead, lowly Gateshead, on the other side of the Tyne there, to show what you could do. You may not like the shape that's happened in the new Gateshead town centre, but you can't at all call it sort of mealy-mouthed. It's there, it, it's an actual shape. It's standing up and saying, I'm the town centre. And that's what the block in Pilgrim Street should have done. And all the other buildings in the centre of Newcastle, the new ones, seem to have the same feeling. The city centre, the, the actual city hall, which, when it was started, was evoking elaborate comparisons with Florence. Well, I don't want to say anything more than it doesn't look like anything either ancient or modern that I've seen in Florence. The new city library by Sir Basil Spence is trying harder, trying harder in the sense of the Gateshead town centre, but without any conviction. It's a fancy dress put on where the, the Gateshead building seems to me to be real. It's been left to buildings on the outskirts to show that the North East can produce good architecture. The new buildings in the university by a variety of architects, but more especially one or two well, local people, like libraries. And those do seem to have the conviction that the North East can produce something to stand up with the past. But so far in the middle of Newcastle, this is missing. But in spite of that, in spite of the uneven quality, and in spite of the fact that there's no real Tyneside style, I'm still hopeful. Not least because the best buildings here are often put up by the local architects. And also, the best buildings have been put up in the last few years. These are Newcastle's newest buildings. The newest buildings in Aarhus, though, are not so funny. They seem to have abandoned the very decent, quiet style, which was just about universal for buildings throughout the 40s and 50s, for, in their newest flats, a rather ugly, slab-sided international style in the worst sense. Could be in Spain or anywhere in England or anywhere in Eastern Europe, for that matter. And if you go outside the town, you'll see the disastrous consequences of Aarhus's industrial revolution because it's just spraying out across the countryside. And although the buildings are not bad, they're neat, the general atmosphere of not really caring about how each one relates to the next is just about as bad as it is in America. And it's worst of all on the sea coast. Because Eastern Jutland, although it's not dramatic, is extremely good landscape. It's very easy to mess it up with even just one or two villas. Or not even villas, just beach huts will do. Sort of things like enlarged garden sheds which you go down to the weekend and then come back to another villa during the week. But this is the way to preserve countryside and coastline. It's the Marcellisborg Woods, which are just east of the town on the south side of the bay. And they were acquired by the municipality as early as 1896. Very far-sighted thing to do. They've been adding bits around the corner ever since. They now control about 10 miles of the coastline here. It's not, in other words, Aarhus's fault that the countryside on the other side of the bay is being spoilt. But the fault of the rural areas around, we're back to this old city-state problem. 
that Aarhus needs to control an area about 30 miles square to ensure that the right bits of countryside are preserved, the right bits of coastline are kept free of bungalows and beach huts. Because in an affluent country like Denmark, it's possible for one family to spoil about half a dozen landscapes in a lifetime. They build a villa out of town, that's one. They then use a car to drive into the town or to the office or for shopping. Multi-story car parks or something equivalent, that's two. They then have a, one of these little beach bungalows to go to at the weekends, that's three. They have a caravan for the holidays, it's very likely they mess up another landscape there. If you've ever seen a Danish churchyard with its tiny bits of trimmed hedge, meticulously raked gravel paths between, dear heaven, they make a suburban estate even around your coffin. Well, that's pitching it a bit high, of course, but there really isn't enough countryside and coastline in Western Europe to go round if we all behave like this. This bit of countryside was spoilt a long time ago. It's felling drops about halfway between Newcastle and Jarrow. The wooden joists there are the bottom of a much bigger structure that originally came from the top of the hill. They used to run rail tracks there, put the coal over on top and then unload it straight into the ships. That now has been something like derelict for, oh, best part of this century. And plans are just getting underway to rehabilitate it, to landscape the whole of the banks of the Tyne. You can see people working up there on the hillside and behind me further on semi-mature trees have been planted. Well, I'm a bit afraid that they're going to make it too polite because the character of this place isn't a sort of glorified public park. It's a very romantic character as it is with fragments of old Tyneside, old industrial Tyneside just sticking up out of rough grass. It really is a very poignant place. And it could be made into an open-air museum that would have a lot more life than the artificial construction in Aarhus. Because all over Northumberland and Durham, there are fragments of the Industrial Revolution that are going out of use of all kinds. The Durham County Council's got a plan to collect them all together at Akeley Heads near Durham. But that's right next to the county hall. It would just be one more compound of archaeology. If they were spread along the banks here, you could be part of a living museum because there's still industry here and you wouldn't really know from one moment to the next where you were looking at past industry or present industry. You could be involved in it. It wouldn't necessarily have to be all museum. You could even have a Tivoli here like they've got in Aarhus. Jeg danser og 
danser og danser og sanser kun dig. Hvorfor løb du dog din vej? Kom igen, kom igen. Here's Tivoli, Tivoli Gardens, Aarhus, a younger and smaller edition of the famous gardens in Copenhagen. Fairground atmosphere, lovely summer evening in July, everyone enjoying themselves, nobody enjoying themselves too much. Kind of cosy, comfortable family atmosphere that I guess perhaps every mother in England would want her children to be brought up in. It's nice. So is Aarhus and so is Denmark. And yet, I wonder, is it enough? Are the social virtues enough? For I came to Aarhus in 1962, just as I came to Hamburg for a very short visit and immediately liked the place very much. At Aarhus I had just one overnight at Hamburg, perhaps just three or four hours. And between then and this year, I hadn't been back. My impression was strong enough to make me feel I really like this place, I really want to make a programme about it. After a week's filming in Hamburg, I'm doubly sure, I think it's one of the greatest cities on earth. After weeks filming in, in Aarhus and in Denmark, and in fact in most of the other places, the, the slight disappointments are beginning to show through. I somehow feel that the Danes haven't got enough to do, that they've solved all their own problems and the surplus energy hanging around wanting to be used somewhere. And I think they ought to go out exploring again as they did so many centuries ago. Not for conquest, but to help, help the underdeveloped nations, give them their expertise because they make very good ambassadors. I think the success of the Scandinavian airline proves that. And they also are one of the very few countries that have no colonial legacy that the nations of Africa, for example, would resent. I think the Danes ought to go out of Vikinging again. <laughs> Hvorfor løb du dog din vej? Kom igen, kom igen.